Welcome to Peacemaking and Peacekeeping. This is the lecture on de-escalation and settlement in conflict situations. This slide represents the conflict curve, which is one of the most frequent representations of conflict with its stages. Latent conflict, conflict emergence, escalation, stalemate, de-escalation, settlement, and post-conflict peacebuilding. This is, however, an ideal model that simplifies the complexity of conflict for the purposes of initial analysis and basic understanding. We should be aware that in the real world, conflicts can take different twists and turns. This curve represents processes for dealing with conflicts at different stages of conflict such as conflict prevention, crisis response, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and post-conflict reconstruction. Let's talk about intractable conflict for a moment as a case for de-escalation. Intractable conflict is one of the most difficult forms of conflict. According to some authors, such as Peter Coleman, it makes up 5% of the conflicts in the world, but it is so deadly and resilient that it demands our attention. These conflicts are uncontrolled, spiraling out, enduring, they defy rationality, and they are often characterized by the memory of atrocities, chosen traumas, that are extremely powerful tools for inciting conflict. They are characterized by uh, negative attitudes and perceptions, distrust, hostility, reinforced by social norms and social pressure, group mobil mobilization, radical leadership, and communication breakdown and destruction of cross-cutting bonds. How can we de-escalate such intractable conflicts? If there is no higher authority to stop the hostilities, intractable conflict will usually continue until development of a mutually hurting stalemate. This is what Zartman explains in his ripeness theory. What does it mean? This means that prominent people on both sides begin hoping to escape or stop the conflict. Third parties need to be aware and need to be alert to this development and establish communication between the parties. If mutual optimism develops, rightness takes place and negotiation or mediation of the conflict can start. This has to come from within, from parties themselves. Ripeness is key to many successful cases of negotiations that led to an agreement, such as the case of Sinai, 1974, Southwest Africa in 1988, El Salvador in 1988, and Mozambique in 1992. Many others, of course. What are the conditions that encourage de-escalation of conflict? Bonds. Bonds between parties discourage escalation and encourage problem solving. We have overlapping versus cross-cutting bonds. In order to resolve intractable conflicts, we need to promote cross-cutting mm. Bonds such as good neighborly relationships, intermarriages, and intergroup friendships. More conditions that discourage escalation. Higher authority that stops escalation, such as police and criminal courts and peacekeeping forces, Conflict resolution mechanisms, such as policies, 
and civil courts, getting the two sides to talk through mediation, dialogue, and interactive conflict resolution. In an agenda for peace, former United Nations Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali defined peacemaking as action to bring hostile parties to agreement, essentially through such peaceful means as those foreseen in Chapter 6 of the Charter of the United Nations, Pacific Settlement of Disputes. We can talk about peacemaking, read small and read large. Peacemaking, read small, suggests that actions are carried out during a conflict, violent or latent. These are diplomatic processes of brokering an end to conflict, such as mediation, conciliation or arbitration. Traditionally, international relations assumes that states are the primary actors in the international system. The realist theories posit that states are motivated by competitive self-interest and power. According to this paradigm, peacemaking is done at the top level with the representatives of states. However, after a proliferation of interstate wars, particularly in the aftermath of the Cold War, the actors in these wars were not necessarily or only state authorities, but also rebel groups, insurgents, protesters, and other non-state actors. For example, if you look at Sudan, we would discover many rebel groups with different agendas. How do we make peace with these actors represents a new challenge to the peacemakers. Non-state actors are not only parties to the conflict, but they also play roles of peacemakers. Non-state actors are not bound by the doctrine of sovereignty, and so they have more freedom to intervene in conflicts. Where does peacemaking take place? In order to determine which is the appropriate approach to peacemaking, one must understand who acts on each level and what actions are best taken at each level. The levels are the top elite, the middle range, and the grassroots. The top level elite leadership comprises the key political, military, and religious leaders in the conflict. They are the primary representatives of their constituencies and are therefore highly visible, which makes it difficult to maneuver. The middle range leadership, such as NGOs, they have intermediary role. Their power is relational and they represent connectors between the top and grassroots level, so they have more space for maneuver and eventually grassroots level with its health officials, refugee camp leaders. This is the level where peacemakers have most space for manure, but often less power. The very fact that NGOs do not have so much power as states can be an advantage. Parties are not intimidated, they do not have vested interests, and so on. They can work as unbiased intermediaries. For example, Sant'Egidio, an NGO from Rome, had a relational power, power of connectivity, and it managed to broker peace in Mozambique after 30 years of war. In Mozambique, two uh, opposing parties accepted the mediation of three representatives of the religious community of Sant'Egidio, as well as the Catholic Archbishop of Beira. Their identity as parties without any political stake in the outcome of the process except peace 
or any of the leverage exercised by foreign governments or multilateral institutions actually made them a successful mediator. So they brokered the peace in Mozambique between Fralimo and Renamo after 30 years of war. Peacemaking in the contemporary world calls for a multi-track and systematic approach. A multi-track approach to peacemaking integrates activity on different levels. Why is it important to take into consideration such integrative approach? Because when you are planning a peacekeeping or peacebuilding mission, you need to have a comprehensive and systemic approach. You need to consider all the parties in the conflict and the ways to engage with them. Such parties are governments, NGOs, business, commerce, private citizens, research education and training institutes, advocacy organizations, religious communities, philanthropic organizations and the media. With this, we finish lecture on the escalation and settlement. Thank you.